So, hello, I'm Annemieke Aasmaris, and in this presentation, I will explain when it's best to move from your preclinical studies to clinical trials in humans. Um, and it's good to bear in mind that there's, there's different steps. So you go from your cell model, to proof of concept to your animal model, proof of concept, delivering to the right targets, etc., and then into clinical trials. And all steps are important to show proof of concept. But does it work in the model system? And then later, does it work in the patient? But the next step is always net, more complicated. So the fact that something works in a cell culture is no guarantee that it will work in a mouse or even further in clinical trials. So this is really important that each step is going to become more complex and more difficult. And therefore, if uh, there's a publication about something working in a cell model, um, well, that's nice, but you have to bear in mind that there's a lot of subsequent steps that still have to be taken before something um, is shown in a clinical trial and it may never reach that stage. So before you move to your clinical trials, you need all the answers. So you need your proof of concept. Is my hypothesis correct? I think compound X, Y, or Z might have a therapeutic effect. Is that indeed the case? And if that is the case, then you need to study things further in preclinical studies. Um, so what is the best dose? Um, I mean, if, if, if we can use a lower dose to have the same functional effects, that is better. What's the best regimen? Um, weekly, daily, monthly, just once, multiple times. What's the best administration route? Oral, injection, etc. You need to use the administration route that you will use also in your, your patients because only then can you design your trial properly. And of course, it's really crucial to use wild type references. So you can say, well, the, the pathology has been improved, but you need to know how much it has improved towards wild type to properly anticipate your therapeutic effect in patients. And, and what's happening, especially in the rare disease field, is that people argue, well, there's an unmet medical need, there's nothing for this patient. So we cannot waste time by answering all these questions in our preclinical model. We need to go to clinical trials as soon as possible. And what's happening then is that you get suboptimal trials because you don't know how to design these trials properly. And then these trials fail. Um, and people say, well, there's poor translatability from going from animal models to trials. Um, and things that work in animal models then don't work in, in, in patients. But that's not always the fault of the animal model. It's sometimes just the fault of people not doing their due diligence in the preclinical studies. And to just give you some examples, there have been instances where compounds turned out to be toxic and not tolerable in humans. And, and then they said, well, maybe we dosed too high and maybe a lower dose would have worked as well. Well, if you done your animal studies, you would have known that and you might see that the lower dose is more tolerable and therefore, and still effective. Um, and other things have, have, uh, have happened as well, where you do your trial and you say, well, maybe we should have dosed twice per week or three times per week rather than weekly, or maybe we should have not given an oral administration, but an injection. And these things, once you've done your trial, you cannot go back. So it's really important to get all the answers and then design your optimal trial. I will now give some examples on how preclinical work um, can sometimes be done wrongly. And I don't want to give these examples to, to illustrate that certain people made mistakes. It's really easy to make mistakes. And I hope that these examples are useful for you and to, to learn from and to improve your own preclinical work. So other people have made these mistakes so that you don't have to make them as well. Um, and well, this first example um, is to show why it's important to use wild type references. So we have here the MDX mouse model for Duchenne, um, where the diaphragm function is impaired because the mouse um, doesn't have dystrophin and there's pathology in the, in the diaphragm. And you see after treatment that uh, the diaphragm function improves. And you can say, well, it goes from five to eight. So that's about a 60% improvement. And 60% improvement sounds really impressive. But now we add the wild types. And you see the wild type is at 100. And this improvement 
really is very minimal if you compare it to the deficit between the wild type and the MDX and the wild type and the treated MDX. So this is why it's crucial to always include your wild type references because that will tell you how much of a therapeutic effect your compound has. And another example is about repurposing. Um, and this is an example where a chemotherapy drug that was already approved for cancer improved the pathology in an MDX mouse model. And here they used normal mice, they used the wild type mice, and the function improved to those levels. Um, also, they showed the pathology, the histology improved close to normal, even in the mostly affected diaphragm. There were no toxic effects seen in the mouse, and this was not just one group showing this, this was three independent groups all showing the same thing. So now you can think, well, that's something. We need to start testing this in indigent patients, and um, this really has high potential. But of course, there is a but. Um, because then, if you look from the human perspective, um, the dose that was used in the mouse um, was five times the dose that's currently used in humans. And we know that in the humans, we cannot increase the dose because this, what's used is the high, highest tolerated dose. A lower dose in the mice did not work. So you need a very high dose. You can't give it in humans. And then another uh, challenge is that, of course, with cancer, often you do temporary treatment. Well, with Duchenne and other rare genetic diseases, you generally need to treat chronically. And well, in humans, you can treat only for three months because then the side effects are such that it's no longer tolerable. So you treat the patients for three months and then you stop. And then maybe later, if needed, you give them another treatment, but you don't treat continuously. While in the mouse model, you have to do this. Um, so that really outlines that it's important when you do drug repurposing to take these things into consideration. So it's really nice if it works in an animal model, but you have to look at it from the perspective of the human situation. So is the dose feasible in humans and is the treatment regimen feasible in humans? And then one last example is this, where, um, and again, MDX mice were treated or not treated with a compound. And after treatment, the animals, the treated animals appear to be stronger. And what's interesting about this is that when you looked in the methods of this, this, um, this study, it turned out that the untreated mice were all females and the treated mice were all males. So the question is, um, what is the conclusion of this, this study? Is it that the treatment improves strength or is the conclusion maybe that male mice are stronger than female mice? Um, and of course, the, 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 the people also didn't use wild type references, but this fact of using one group only males and one group only females and then drawing a conclusion on strength that is, of course, not how it should be done. Um, and these are, again, these are things that you may only consider in hindsight. I hope that you learn now to plan this better. Um, and then finally, I think it's really important to publish also about things that do not work. Um, if you don't share your data on compounds that don't show therapeutic effect, this may mean that other people somewhere else are also studying this. And that's a duplication of effort and that's a waste of time, of money, animal, of, for, and it's, it's bad for the researchers because it's, I mean, it's not nice that you test something and then you hear, well, we tested it as well and we also didn't get it to work. Um, but also for patient organizations who provide money, who have hopes, etc. So publish this because then other academics can look at it and say, well, okay, in your hands it didn't work, but we'll try it slightly different, a new formulation, a new regimen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, also, if you don't publish it, so often what happens is that one group publishes that compound X works, and then three others try to replicate it, and if they don't manage and they don't publish, then this may lead to things going into clinical trials while the effects are not robust. And for rare diseases, this is unacceptable. So I really urge you, even if things do not work, please do publish this. And it may think like it may seem like you're a bad scientist if your hypothesis fails, but actually that's not how it works. As a scientist, 
you have a hypothesis and you test it. And often you were able to find funding to test your hypothesis. So there was a peer review system. So other people agreed that your idea was good and merited testing. But then if it's not turning out as you hoped it would be, it's still important to publish about it. And I want to uh, make you aware that the Journal of Neuromuscular Diseases in the neuromuscular field uh, currently has um, a special section called the Null Hypothesis Stand to, well, welcome all these so-called negative results or things that you hoped would work but didn't work out. And there was an inaugural um, um, uh, issue to commemorate this, but the journal will continue welcoming these type of, of uh, studies. And I know other journals are doing this as well. So I think that is a good development. Um, and I really would urge you to, to submit also the things that did not work as you hoped. So thank you very much. If you have questions, please do not hesitate to email me. And my email address is on the slide. And I hope you found this presentation useful.